for joining us today for a clinical review of OASIS C2 for first home care users. My name is Megan Henry, Marketing Communications Manager for Healthcare First, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items to make sure your webinar experience is a good one. Next slide. You have joined today's webinar listening through your computer speaker system by default. This means if you can hear music through your computer, you will be able to hear our presentation. However, if you would like to call in using the phone, just locate your audio pane and select Use Telephone, and the dial-in information and access code will then be displayed. You have the ability to ask questions throughout the webinar using your questions pane. Simply type in your question and click Send. At the end of this presentation, we will do a Q&A session and take as many questions as we have time for. The handout for this webinar is available within GoToWebinar. To view, just locate the Handouts pane in your control panel and select the file for download. You can then click the downloaded file to open or save it. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded and we will distribute the recording to attendees following the webinar. Next slide. I would like to take just a quick moment to tell you a little bit about one of the things we are most excited about here at Healthcare First, our new Home Health Solution Suite. When developing our solution suite, we identified three key things that keep agency owners up at night. Compliance with ongoing and ever-increasing regulatory requirements, cash flow and reimbursement, agencies want to get claims out the door quicker and keep everything they are paid and of course the ability to continue to offer quality patient care. Because we already offer powerful software tools and services to help agencies with each of these things, we've combined them to create one unique integrated suite that will dramatically change the way you run your business. So here you can see the list of things we include in the solution suite. Some you may already be familiar with and use, and some may be new to you. We have our comprehensive EMR software, First Home Care, which everyone on this call already uses, OASIS Review and Coding Services, Billing Services, Business Intelligence, HHCAPS Survey Administration, and DDE Connectivity. So at the end of this webinar, I'll be providing a bit more detail about the benefits of Solution Suite and explain how it will revolutionize the way you run your business. But now I would like to introduce to you Mary St. Pierre. Mary is the former Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for the National Association for Home Care and Hospice. While there, she oversaw the operations of the Regulatory Affairs Department, tracking regulations and influencing regulatory bodies such as CMS, FDA, and OSHA. Since retiring in 2013, Mary has served as a National Home Health and Hospice Consultant and is currently working with Healthcare First to provide regulatory guidance in the design and maintenance of our products and services. So now, without further ado, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Mary. Thank you very much. And I, I'm hoping that what I, what I leave for you today, what you can take back with you, is um, a, a tool that you can use in identifying the changes that CMS has uh, made, made to OASIS in the development of this OASIS V2. But I'd like to first start with a little bit of history as to how this, um, this came about. Um, the Impact Act, I'm sure you have heard about this for the last couple of years. It was uh, came about as a result of a bill passed by Congress and, and signed by the President in uh, 2014. And it, what it does is address the need for standardized patient assessment in post-acute care settings, so skilled nursing facilities, um, LTACs, ERFs, and home health agencies. And it requires that uh, CMS work with their contractors to develop assessment items that have some uniformity across these settings. They also want to be sure to allow for the exchange of data. So at some point when patients are transferred from one setting to another, uh, the information will be in a common format. The data will be easily retrievable and can be sent to the receiving organization, the receiving provider. Uh, they hope that at some point there can be also standardization and uh, to be able to count on a comparison of that quality data across those post-acute settings. 
Uh, all of these things they believe will re result in uh, improved, better discharge planning, um, more uh, easily conformity that patients then transferring from one setting to the next in a much easier manner, uh, coordination of care, and then the end result being improving quality and, re and, and an improvement in outcomes of care. I've provided to you here with a link to the OASIS CT C2 guidance manual, and this manual into effect, these, these OASIS C2 and all of its guidance goes into effect January the 1st, 2017. Uh, this, this manual is much easier to use than the uh, OASIS C1 online manual. Actually, all the guidance is flows through in the text of the manual, and you don't have to click from chapter to chapter for each of the different body systems, each of the different OASIS parts, so it is easier to use in that way. Well, I want to give you a, an overview of the changes, and uh, what I've done is I've summarized the CMS description of changes, and I'm also, I've also summarized the manual changes. Um, when you hear what these are and how many there are, uh, I'm hoping that you can take this PowerPoint and you can use the information in relationship to each of the individual OASIS items to get a bird's eye view of what it is that, that, that CMS changed without having to do, as I did, a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, the OASIS C1 manual with the OASIS C2 manual. So I'm hoping I might be able to save you some time and some angst in, in understanding and knowing what exactly it is. So we have in this OASIS C2 now three new standardized items along with the guidance that goes along with them. Uh, also, uh, CMS, what they've done is they've taken a look at uh, those OASIS Q&As. Many of you are familiar with them, probably posed the questions to the OASIS Help Desk and receive responses which are posted on, on the CMS website. So they've taken a um, number of those clarifications in the responses that you had to go to the manual and then you had to go to the Q&As in order to find out, well, is there any further information on this? But they've incorporated that into, into the manual, those clarifications in the responses to the questions. Um, they also have changed response-specific instructions to 50 OASIS items, and this is probably the largest area where I hope that this can be helpful. As I said, I did a side-by-side -side comparison of the response-specific instructions in C1 uh, and compared it to the response-specific instructions in C2. Uh, and in many cases, I'm able to point out very minor, minor changes from one to the other. Uh, the other thing they did was add a dash as a valid response, and I'll tell you more about that and when it can be used. And they've done uh, um, a number of formatting changes. Uh, they, the now the pressure ulcers have been changed. Some were Roman numerals, others were not, but now they're all changed Roman to Arabic numerals. They've also, instead of having uh, boxes next to each possible response and have you check a box, each response is labeled with a number or a letter, in most instances a letter, and there is an, a box that in which you enter that letter code or that number code. So that, that is a change in the way it looks, not a change in the actual um, substance of the item, but in how it looks and how the OASIS looks. And also, um, they've now put in places where there were dashes, there are now boxes. <clears throat> now, I should let you know that um, Healthcare First still has an outstanding question to CMS on using these format changes and uh, to what extent they have to be incorporated. Uh, it, and we've already heard in the software it's not necessary, but now we're waiting for a response in, uh, as to how the printed OASIS or the on-screen OASIS must, must look related to these format changes. Additionally, they've renumbered select items, and uh, the items that they have renumbered are pressure ulcer, 
um, uh, heart disease, uh, drug regimen review, and emergent care. And and as you go through, you'll see that uh, which of which of those have changed numbers. There are also new skip directions because when you renumber, you have to change the skip pattern. And just subsequent to the renumbering that they've done. They have um, revised the look, the guidance for the look back period for five items. And they've also done some rewording. And hopefully with the idea that this will help the clinicians when they complete the OASIS as to how to count days or what prior OASIS they're looking at. So they've changed the wording from during the past 14 days to within the past 14 days. And I'll give you more detail as to how then that they, they're now guiding the, the uh, user of the OASIS to actually count and what they count as zero. They've uh, changed the words previous, um, the previous OASIS to from the most recent start of care, resumption of care assessment. And you'll see here I've enumerated um, which OASIS items that, that, that those, those words have been changed. Also, they've clarified that when the words present on admission are used, it actually means present at the start of care, the resumption of care. That present on admission or present at start of care resumption care have a equivalent meanings. And this really means what they mean for OASIS for present and admission is that um, this is the start of this quality episode. So um, that's something that, again, you'll have to make sure that your clinicians and your staff are clearly understand that they are using those terms interchangeably. They've amended the ICD-10 code. Um, uh, excuse me, to, they've made amendments for, for diagnosis reporting to accommodate those uh, revised ICD-10 codes. They're now allowing for re reporting of the uh, seven-digit codes. And they've also, um, in their references, removed references to the VNE codes. Now we're going to talk about uh, the three new items, and, uh, and I'll give you more details about them. Um, M1028 calls for identifying whether the person has an active diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease or diabetes. It is a new impact act item. The um, next is M1060, a patient's height and weight, and uh, that's uh, the, the uh, allows for them calculating uh, a, a patient's BMR. And um, a GG0170C, again, um, another item that is allows for there to be consistency across providers is mobility from lying to sitting on the side of the bed. Uh, how are these going to be used? Well, uh, definitely they're being used in, in a risk, as a risk adjustment factors. For example, for pressure ulcer staging, um, M1313, A, B, and C, uh, that reference stage 2, 3, and 4 pressure ulcers, they are going to be used for risk adjustment. Um, the amount of systems needed in mobility, um, whether the individual has diabetes and what their BMI is, and um, also along with that, a bowel is a, is a part of the risk adjustment. But um, just for you to see, to give you an example of how they will be used. Now, on far as the in item intent, CMS changed the item intent on five different items. Um, that the patient have an unhealed pressure ulcer, they have a skin lesion, drug regimen review, and then the medication follow-up and interventions. And when I do each of those, I will then provide you, um, oops, and I'm looking, I'm missing a digit on that. I, that should be M2005 at the end medication intervention. So um, when, when we go into detail on them, I'll give you a better idea of how that item intent was changed. As far as the dashes, 
uh, you're, you're now allowed to use them. There are very specific OASIS items uh, that you can use them for, and they are listed here. But CMS says that um, you should only be using them in very narrow situations, and that is on those in those instances when you're unable to collect the information. The information isn't available at the time the assessment is being completed. So they expect it to be used rarely. And um, they give examples, transfer, death, uh, discharge, where you did not expect it and there wasn't a sufficient time to collect the information. I, mean, I do need to tell you I participated in a CMS webinar the other day about the IMPACT Act and about the, uh, the, the ch changes in the patient assessments across provider types. And the skilled nursing facilities are very concerned about the use of DASHs and whether it will in fact in, in, in impact their outcomes and their the, the reporting of their quality of care. And it was made very clear during that call that yes, they will impact the measure outcomes because uh, as you can see, many of these items in fact are used for risk adjustment. So when speaking with your clinicians about the DASH and when to use it as opposed to you know, when definitely to try to avoid using it, um, remind, me, remind them of this. And to be absolutely certain that it is used, being used all, very discriminately and only um, in rare instances when they're unable to collect information. The items that were changed, uh, if you probably saw a few of them, you said, what is 1313? I don't recognize that, or 1311. And uh, so pressure ulcers, heart, heart failure, drug um, and medication follow-up, and caregiver education, those are the categories where the items have changed, the item numbers have changed. And of course, any skip patterns related to them will have changed as well. Uh, it, it, the item text in many, in several of these instances also change. So you want to be very sure when you see a number change, you say, okay, let me read that item text very carefully to be sure I understand how this differs in, in the OASIS C1. And I'm going to go through some of the minor changes. Uh, just to give you an idea, to help you so that you won't feel you have to do, as I said, that side-by-side -side comparison with OASIS C1, which is what I've done. I've pulled out how is this, these response-specific instructions on start of care different um, from, from OASIS C1. And uh, in many, many cases, they are very minor changes. So um, in, in all of the instances where they had examples, and in their example they referenced go in August of 2014, well, they updated those examples to say in August of 2000, 2017. Uh, on the start of care, they did del delete references to the regulation, the conditions of participation. Uh, and they did this throughout any place in the C1 instructions where it said COP at 42 CFR, whatever that number was, they've deleted the actual um, regulatory citation. And that is, I believe, I, I, I can't think of any other reason to do this, is because CMS has proposed COPs outstanding. They honestly actually were hoping to publish them uh, by the end of September and according to my contacts there. They haven't done it yet. Uh, they are still hoping that it will be before what would be considered um, the, the political cutoff date, the cutoff date for any regulation that um, when you're going to have a change in administration um, the, the next president in can actually rescind that if it's in a certain period of time. So um, they, they still have a little bit of time, uh, probably another two weeks, probably till the end of October. I have a feeling if we don't see uh, the, those proposed COPs released by the Office of Management and Budget by, by the end of October that we uh, 
probably won't see them, maybe not at all. If they don't publish them by 2017, they have to go back and actually rewrite all of the proposed COPs. That's what, um, that's what legislation requires now. If they aren't published as final within three years, they have to rewrite them as proposed and should start the whole process again. Uh, so in 30, they took out that regulatory uh, reference. They also took out about a uh, 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 statement about the physician must specifically order that a particular covered service be furnished on the start of care date. That reference is gone. Uh, M32, the resumption of care, there was a format change only there. For the birth date, they only updated the examples to 2017. Um, for M69 for gender, the only change there was the data source, and they did add this statement that if a patient doesn't self-identify their gender, uh, referral information including the hospital or physician record or observation can be used. There, there is where you look for uh, the, the information in order to respond to that particular question. Uh, in 110 episode timing, and you'll see this throughout also, where they changed the response specific instruction. The only change was the word enter versus the word select. And then in M903, uh, the date of the last most recent home visit, they did change the response specific instructions. Here, um, that you had to, they have to report the last visit made by the agency staff. And they added the words whether or not it was included on the plan of care. Earlier instructions, OASIS-C said that said that it was um, the last visit that was included that that was included on the plan of care. In C2, they have deleted that that instruction, whether or not it was on the plan of care. In uh, M1011, they have um, uh, each inpatient this is 1017, the diagnosis requiring medical treatment change. Uh, 1,600 treatment for UTI, 1,700 the cognitive function, 1,710 when confused, and 1,720 anxious. All of these have very simple changes to them. It, these changes are in the response-specific instructions, and um, they define, as I mentioned previously, they define the past 14 days as the two-week period immediately preceding the start of care. And then they go on to say, for the purpose of counting that 14-day period, the start of care date is day zero. Again, a lot of these were already in the OASIS questions and answers, had been clarified, but now they've actually within the manual. And then they go on to say the date immediately prior to the start of care date is day one. In 1018, prior uh, condition prior to the regimen change, where they ad ad amended the language uh, from a mission to start of care resumption of care. Uh, and the word admission has been amended to start of care, resumption of care. And as I mentioned to you earlier, that really has to do with the fact that they're trying to say for the purposes of OASIS, admission is the same thing as start of care, resumption of care. And they added that 14-day count for uh, the, the instructions, for the response-specific instructions. Um, they, that definition, that description has been added to this OASIS item just as it was to the prior one. Um, the response-specific instructions for the diagnosis, very minor edits, these kinds of things that I'm referring to, the 14-day count or the start of care, uh, resumption of care, those kinds of edits. The M1034, patient's overall status, they changed the word from select to enter. Now we're going to go into some of those M items that have a little bit more detail in the changes. And uh, for M90, the date the OASIS was completed, they did revise those example dates um, to now reflect 2017. And they added some language 
to several of the bullets that were already in OASIS C1. Um, for example, agency policy allowing the assessments being performed over more than one visit date, the late last date is the appropriate date to record. This is a clarification of prior instructions. Um, if the clinician isn't able to complete it during the visit, they have to do follow-up off-site, then uh, the uh, clinician is allowed to reflect the date, now allowed to reflect the date that the last needed information is collected. Um, another clarification, if the clinician needs to gather additional information during the uh, five assessment time frame, um, then they go on to say just as currently the date would not be changed to reflect that. And then um, if an error is identified at any time, the, the agency is to correct the error, um, but that may or may not affect the M90 date. That may not necessarily be changed is how they were that. Um, for M104, the date of referral example was changed. Um, they've added um, information about what is considered a valid referral. And to the language there uh, regarding a valid referral to the, to the bullet instructions for valid referral, they say it's when adequate information is received about a patient and that the agency is ensured that the referring physician will provide the plan of care and ongoing orders. Now, they don't say you have to have them, but that you have to be sure that you will receive them. Um, don't, they don't give any guidance on how you come by that assurance. Also, they added that if a hospitalist won't be providing that ongoing plan of care, patient is being referred, hospitalist, right now we say, oh, the hospitalist had their face-to-face -face encounter, um, but it's the, it's the community physician that's going to be providing the um, ongoing plan of care, then this instruction now says that the agency must contact that alternate, that community physician or the attending physician that's going to be providing these orders for referral and or further orders. And this is a change that um, all agencies are going to have to take a close look at what the practice is now and how they do that. Um, they also added guidance if the start of care is delayed then the date of referral is the date the agency received updated revised information. Uh, again, long-term long practice, but this has been included in the manual now. And they give examples of what's excluded. Excluded information from others. They say excluded information from my ALS, and they say in excludes information from the patient's payer. Now, the new um, M1028, the active diagnosis and comorbidities and coexisting conditions, uh, this is what the patients, um, whether the patient has these two conditions. And not only um, does is it, is it implied or suggested or the patient tells you or the family tells you that they have these conditions, but in fact, has the clinician, has the agency confirmed that these have been diagnosis made by the, in the medical information, in the medical record, in the hospital record, uh, in any of the clinical information that's either sent to the agency, say at the time of the referral in a discharge summary, or that the agency clinician confirms with the physician in, before responding to this question. So one, is it present? And then two, they have to confirm if it's active. Um, that confirmation can be through things like it's the medication that they're on or the treatments they're receiving. The item rationale, uh, they, they, they say that they've included this item, and this is an across provider uh, uh, item, is um, that it influences the outcomes. And if a patient has these conditions, they have increased risk, risk of pressure ulcers. And it also, having these conditions can have an adverse effect on their status, health status and quality of life. Um, they, uh, instructions are to check all and uh, 
and there is a complete list of the diagnoses that they consider to be appropriately defined as peripheral vascular disease and diabetes in the OASIS manual. And then um, are they active? Um, and th these are comorbidities. Are they coexisting conditions? There, um, the response-specific instructions, as I said, you have to verify in the medical record uh, or with the physician if there is no documentation received. And as I mentioned, is it active? Is the blood glucose monitoring? Is the wound care or the peripheral pulses being checked? And um, is, is the patient on medication? Now, remember I said earlier, the patient could be checked, yes, of having these conditions. They could be checked, yes, as, as um, can confirm with the physician as that they are active diagnoses. And in fact, they not appear on uh, the OASIS as one of the diagnoses that you select in your limited list that you're allowed to have or on your plan of care. And, we, and I always encourage agencies to expand upon and not just include the six, but include others that are active. But it might be that it's been determined that you're not going to address these diagnoses in your plan of care for some reason. Um, and that's permissible to do. I just want everyone to think about whether that's wise in regard to in relationship to um, the, the care that you deliver to the patient and the observations and the interventions that might be necessary might be good nursing practice when a patient has either of those conditions. Height and weight is another additional condition from the IMPACT Act. It's uh, collected on start and resumption of care. And uh, the, um, the purpose is to uh, and be able to calculate the patient's BMI. I'm sorry, I earlier said BMR, but it's BMI. And um, it, it counts because it's important for nutritional status. Uh, important for determining the patient's vulnerability if they have that malnutrition or dehydration. Um, malnutrition can adversely affect wound healing, uh, decrease the, increase the risk for development of pressure ulcers. And um, weight is used in uh, for patients with heart failure to check for fluid retention. So these will let CMS says are the rationales. Um, they give specific response specific instructions on how you collect that information that you should choose rounding. And uh, the measuring of these, they say, is in accord with agency policy and procedure and, of course, best practice standards. Um, they, they give a definition of height as the most recent height since the recent start of care and uh, weight on the most recent measure in the last 30 days. Now, again, during this call, that I was on a CMS call, uh, the nursing home folks really expressed some concern about this because of the difficulty and the inability to weigh patients. And of course, we have that problem even to a greater degree in, in home health. Uh, so um, just keep that in mind and, and try to find out how ways that you might be resolve that issue so that you can collect that information. Uh, Vision and pain assessment. Under vision, they um, added in response specific instructions a, a, a just a statement about physical deficits or, or impairments that limit the ability to, to use their existing vision in a functional way. Uh, so that's another guide on or a cue on what to do for the clinician to do when assessing a patient's vision. Um, and then the 1240 about the formal pain assessment, they give you some guidance about which response to select when a valid assessment has been, has been conducted. And I'm not going to read that, but it is available there for you to, to use. Uh, as I said, Pressure ulcers, they change from Arabic to, uh, from, excuse me, from Roman to Arabic numbers. And, the, um, and this is M1306. Uh, in, in some of the instances where they say they change the item intent, I really could not find a difference in the meaning. Rather, there was merely a difference in the arrangement of words. So now that item intent 
leaves the presence or absence of unstageable or unhealed stage two ulcers uh, um, or higher pressure ulcers. Um, that was the prior statement. Now the, the, the statement is the presence or absence of unhealed stage two or higher or unstageable pressure ulcers only. So in comparison, comparing the two, as I said, I honestly had trouble figuring out what the difference was other than a reorganization of the words. Uh, for 1306, does the patient have an unhealed pressure ulcer? The response specific instruction changes are extensive. They've added quite a bit of information. And this really is in relationship to the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel Guidelines. Um, and what CMS says in this, the, the, these detailed guidance for responding to M1306 is that, yes, agencies can adopt, should adopt the NPUAP guidelines, but they don't, the definitions don't always align perfectly with CMS's definitions for the description of the pressure ulcers, and when there are discrepancies, you should use the CNS OASIS instructions. Um, and they gave some further insights into how to respond to healed or unhealed, whether a pressure ulcer is healed or unhealed, and what they mean is it's closed versus open. They also um, gave a little more detail about suspected deep, tinger, excuse me, deep tissue injury uh, and, and advised that's not to be a, a stage one DTI is not to be considered healed. And also they talk about unstageable pressure ulcers. In the guidance they've added that uh, uh, that would not be considered healed. In um, 1307, the oldest stage two pressure ulcer, uh, they go on to say that in identifying the older is, is that it's present at the time of discharge and not fully healed, that uh, clinicians should assess the length of time it remained unhealed, and to identify the patients who developed those while under the care of the agency. These are item intent changes where they've added to um, the rationale for in having this particular M item that is present at the time of discharge and not fully healed, that the length of time it's remained unhealed is important, and what types of patients develop these. Uh, the response-specific instructions roam into Arabic again, and um, they've added the oldest stage to pressure ulcer present at discharge, what it excludes, and um, the, 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 the changes of the reference to start of care, resumption of care assessment. Um, the, the responses there say, one, it was present at the most recent, or two, it developed since the most recent. And then uh, the clinician is to record the date pressure ulcer is identified. And then a happy NA. So these are the response-specific options, one, two, and three. One was present, two developed since, and three NA, no stage two pressure ulcer. They have additional extensive response specific instructions. So this is one of those M items where you really need to go to the manual and read very carefully through the items, um, the guidance that they give for responding. The uh, current number of unhealed pressure ulcers at each stage uh, that purpose of present, whether it's present on admission, uh, these have been, a, this is assigned a new item number. This is M1311, it was M1308. Uh, it has new text, uh, item text, and has new responses. Here's another one where you can use a dash, and uh, there are new skip directions. The um, the purpose of this, it identifies the number of stage two pressure ulcers at each stage at the time of assessment. Stage two or higher at each stage present at, it, at the time of assessment. And then uh, stage one pressure ulcers and ulcers that have healed and are, are, are not re to be responded to in this item. So in its guidance, they again warn you against using this particular item to record stage one ulcers. They are not to be reported in this item at all. 
Uh, in the response specific instructions, they again reference that healed versus unhealed, meaning closed versus open. Um, that uh, again, the, the the deep tissue injury would not be considered healed, and finally, those unstaged ulcers, whether covered with a non-removable dressing or or would not be considered healed. And on 13.13, the worsening in the pressure, pressure ulcer and the status in started care resumption of care also has a new item number, new item text, new response options. It, this is an impact act item. It, uh, again, a dash is valid. And the, the response specific instructions are extensive. So this is another one that you really want to you and your clinicians to read through thoroughly and carefully to be sure that you understand the intent and uh, how to respond to this particular OASIS item in light of these changes. And um, the time point completed, this is at discharge. There was, there is a revision, as I said, to, to the item selection. And in this case, what CMS did was take what was once D in, in OASIS uh, C1 and um, break it down into D, E, and F. So we don't have just unstageable, but rather it's unstageable B because it has a non-removable dressing, E because it's, the wound bed is covered by SLOF or SCAR, or S because uh, there's a suspected deep tissue injury. Now 1320, um, again the healed versus unhealed and the reference to deep tissue injury. Uh, furthermore, in the response specific instructions, they give guidelines on determining whether um, a, an unstageable pressure ulcer, if it's covered by a dressing or escar sloth, would not be considered healed in the following ways for the clinicians to evaluate or assess. Um, they tell you the steps, which ones are observable, uh, which of the observable is most problematic when answering this question, and then uh, advise you to use the WOCN guidance to determine the status of the most problematic. So we have now the data sources, NPUAP we mentioned earlier, but now they all bring in the, the wound and ostomy continence nursing society's guidance as a data source for learning how to appropriately respond. Uh, 1322 is the current number of stage one pressure ulcers, and again, you need to read carefully, extensive response specific instructions here. Um, these are all the same as I provided with you previously about healed versus unhealed, uh, deep tissue injury, uh, stageable, unstageable, and, and then determining the most of, uh, which observable is the most problematic. So detailed guidance, want to be sure to read that thoroughly. Uh, 1324, uh, the response options changed. Uh, now there are stage one, two, and three, or four. And uh, the specific instructions, again, healed versus unhealed, determine which is stageable or unstageable, and determine which pro pressure ulcer is most problematic, like what the guidance that they're offering here. The surgical wounds, um, the response specific instruction changes are minor. All they did was delete the, um, the, the, the skin adjacent that may have had a removal of sutures not being considered part of the surgical wound. Uh, also, does the patient have skin lesion, receiving intervention? Um, they very clearly say here, and not already addressed in previous items. Um, that that is the that is the change in that guidance for the item intent. Item intent is not previously not already addressed in previous items when you're talking about a skin lesion. Uh, the symptoms of heart failure. The item number changed and the skip directions here changed. 
and um, the item intent, all they did was replace uh, the words from most recent OASIS to the start of care resumption of care assessment. A very simple language exchange. And um, they're saying that the, this identifies whether a patient with a diagnosis of heart failure experienced one or more symptoms at the time or at any time since, again, the most recent start of care resumption of care assessment. Very minor changes in this particular OASIS item except the number change, the skip directions change, and that start of care resumption of care reference change. In uh, the A response specific instructions, they do go on to talk about um, item details. If the patient has been diagnosed with heart failure, they give you guidance on which response to select. Uh, and um, one, two, or three, if the diagnosis of heart failure, whether it's mentioned someplace else or not, is documented. It doesn't matter if it's documented elsewhere or not. Uh, and A, if they don't have a diagnosis of heart failure. And then if response one is yes, report, the report of symptoms associated with heart failure, even if some other condition, a comorbidity, could have produced those. If they're symptoms of heart failure, then they, they, sh they should be, it should be answered yes. And in the guidance, they say that um, the, the clinician is to consider any new or ongoing heart failure symptoms that occurred at the time of or at any time since the most recent start of care resumption of care. Cognitive behavior, that's M1740 and 1745, they give more detail in the response specific instructions for cognitive and psychiatric symptoms of what the clinician is to consider, what behaviors they're to look at. And they say that there are any behaviors associated with neurological, developmental, behavioral, or psychiatric disorders. And 1745, the frequency of disruptive behavior, again, they give a little bit more guidance in those instructions when they talk about behaviors associated, again, with those same kinds of conditions, neurological, cognitive behavior, developmental, or psychiatric. And um, either, either identified through a diagnosis or through the clinician's clinical judgment. So you could have a diagnosis for those, you maybe know, but if the clinician in their clinical judgment feels that that type of behavior is being, ex disruptive behavior is being displayed, then they should respond appropriately to that new item. Uh, on 1740 and 18, uh, 1840, where we're talking about ADLs, IDA, ADLs, very simple changes of the word from the word pick to it's replaced with the word enter. And um, they have included in their guidance to enter the response that best describes the patient's level of ability to perform the majority of dressing lower body, lower body tasks. So a uh, little bit more insight into how you, when you would respond, or how you would respond to that particular item. They did something simple here and in a couple other places removed underlining of words, so I've kind of taken away the emphasis. Um, and they added the patients needing standby assistance when they responded to, and they've added in a spotter. As far as toilet transfers, here's again where they removed an emphasis or an underlining. And then they did add in here guidance what to do if there's no toilet in the home. And uh, they, the, the determination of the patient's ability would be based on how they use a, a commode, a bedpan, or a urinal. Um, mobility lying, uh, just sitting on the side of the bed, that's that new item. Uh, it is an impact act item. And uh, the rationale um, is, uh, is its use is because Immobility can affect the patient's need for um, the amount of assistance that they need, can greatly affect wound healing pressure ulcers and other things if we certainly know of a, a, a lot of other functional 
activities that can that can be affected. And um, it includes the admission performance and it includes a discharge goal in that particular item. So this is one where you definitely need to read those in detail. And what it's referring to is specifically the ability to safely move from lying on the back to sitting on the side of the bed with feet on the flat on the floor and no back support. Um, they're looking for how much assistance does the patient need with mobility task. And the uh, codes for this particular item are uh, go from 06, independent, no human assistance, to 01, dependent. Uh, the caregiver must provide all of the effort. And we at Healthcare First did try to determine whether there was some sort of alignment between this and other ADL, uh, IADL functions. And really, this is a totally distinct, separate item measurement that's not covered elsewhere. Um, for prior functioning, ADL, IADL, it's the format of the responses that changed, um, the options changed. It's the same text and uh, response-specific instructions for each functional area. So um, they, they, they also change the word enter as opposed to select. And you can see here, uh, I, I tried as best I could to replicate how it looks. This is an enter code box, and these are the selections that you would have for um, the prior functioning IADL, ADL, it's the patient's usual ability with everyday activity, and now they say enter the code. And the activities are, each of these is separate and distinct. Each of these has its own three choice selection and an enter code box, self-care, ambulation, transfer, and household tasks. Under drug regimen review, again, new impact act item, the numbers and the text and the response option, except for M2003 have changed, dash is valid, and they've changed the descriptions. So you can see here the item responses, no issues, issues found, and the NA patient is not taking any medications. They've taken out not assessed. They've removed that totally. And um, the definitions include a definition for medication interaction and drug drug reaction, and um, they made some slight changes in wording problems or now issues. It captures information for, it used to, they used to say they capture, it captured information for calculating process measures, but it does no longer. There are extensions, extensive additions and revisions to the response specific instruction for M2001, and uh, you, you need to really look at those closely. Um, the in item intent on 2003 medication follow-up, they add in here by midnight of the next calendar day. And that is throughout those areas related to medications where it's identify and report to the physician by midnight of the next calendar day. And they also added language under, so that's in the text itself, by midnight of the next calendar day of that medication follow-up item. Under item intent, they've added that um, they're referring to a, a medication review addressed by with a physician by midnight of the next calendar day. They've also removed that reference to calculating process measures. And then they give an extensive definition of contact with a physician. What is it? It's communicating with a physician or his designee by any means, that you appropriately convey a, a, a message, um, that um, directions to or from the physician or the designee, and this could be, they say, through the physician's office staff on behalf of the physician or designee, which is a wonderful thing to include in the instructions. The response-specific instructions, again, talk about what to report, when to report, and this guidance is extensive. Um, and it also includes references to the physician's recommendation. Under medication intervention, the number and the intent since the previous assessment and removal of that reference to calculating process measures. Under the text, they put in them by midnight of the next night. And the item responses are 0, 1, and NA, just as in the previous. Uh, this is another one. So pressure ulcers, medications, extensive revisions, and you need to read them carefully and closely. Um, under the drug 
10, uh, excuse me, 2016 a drug education intervention, item number change, the text. It includes um, the most recent start of care resumption of care and um, the response specific instructions. They talk about it addressing all medications the patient's taking, whether they're prescribed or over the counter by any route. And they, they have a guidance on effective self-management of medications and what that includes, all of the details of what should be included. Uh, management of oral and injectable medications, they give um, guidance to use the word enter. They've changed the word from, from, from select to enter. And you'll see that select is removed from all of these guidances. The word enter is put in instead. And um, they, these are medications that are how to differentiate between PO medications is explained in further detail. And they do include in here a reference to persons living in assisted living facilities and how to how to respond to this particular license item when a patient lives in an ADL. Uh, prior medication management text changed. It's matter of excuse me, it's matter of being reformatted, but it didn't actually change the language. And um, the, uh, entering a code versus a checkbox, and again, the um, select being changed to enter. Uh, types and sources of, of, of assistance, again, there is an enter code here uh, rather than a checkbox. Uh, additionally, the, the select, change to enter. But they also added here uh, to the guidance or instructions that it's non-agency caregivers. And uh, that's added throughout as appropriate. The therapy need, uh, it's changed from report um, and answer. They've changed this words enter. They, again, deleted the COP reference number. They have final COPs. And then deleted the underlining. Uh, Merge of care, and this is our final one, where the um, reference to most recent start of care. So item number changed. They now have an enter code. And they have the uh, change to the most recent start of care resumption of care. The skip directions have changed on this as well. And the response specific instructions now say enter. Um, the, um, also, the response-specific um, instructions that the term does not address has been changed to exclude. So it's actually excluding is more inclusive. And uh, they deleted the doctor's office uh, where the reason for emergent care and scheduled less than 24 hours has been deleted from that um, particular instruction for um, the, the senior and the patient's physician's office. And the intervention synopsis, again, previous assessments, start of care, resumption of care, um, where you check only one box, and the following interventions included in the physician's ordered plan of care and implemented. So it's a change in meaning and focus there. And of course, uh, from last OASIS, the most recent start of care resumption of care. OK, I, I know we only have a, uh, we're going to turn this over to Diana. She has a few things to say. Thank you, Mary. I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that the next webinar in the series will be on November uh, 17th. And that is when we will walk you through the actual changes in first home care and show you uh, the updated forms and how your staff will actually use them uh, to keep in compliance with the new OASIS C2 changes. And that and other information regarding the documentation was included in the handout that you have for the webinar. So at this point, I'm going to hand back off to Megan see if we have any time for any questions. We have just a minute for questions. Um, got a couple here. If we can answer them real quick, because we want to be uh, mindful of your time. Mary, is the diagnosis considered active if they are receiving medications to treat it? Yes, and that's in its, in its um, response to specific instructions. So yeah, if someone's receiving a medication, then it is considered active. 
Excellent. The other question that I have is, if a client is waited at the doctor's office, can that wait be used in a non-ambulatory client? You know what? I'm going to have to see if I can find the answer to that. <laughs> I will. Um, I'll, I'll check into that, and um, Megan, I'll get an answer to you, and maybe we can get that out to the folks of where that weight has to originate. My impression is it has to originate by the from the clinician who's doing the assessment, but I will check into it. Very good. And that's all the questions that we have right now. Certainly, if you do have additional questions, uh, there will be a survey that pops up at the end that you can ask those questions as well or go ahead and enter them into the Q&A panel. Um, Mary, if you could go ahead and flip the slide. We want to thank you, Indiana, for this webinar today. And real quick, at the beginning of this webinar, I introduced the Home Health Solution Suite. Just want to tell you really quickly what it can do for you. Um, as the home health industry's only total agency management package, the Solution Suite will really transform the way you run your business by combining industry-leading software, services, and analytics into one integrated suite. So by leveraging our Solution Suite, you're going to maximize your reimbursement while reducing overhead costs which in turn increases profitability for your agency. We ensure regulatory compliance and reduce your risk of takebacks and audits by ensuring you submit clean claims each and every time. Solution Suite also helps to ensure you provide quality patient care, which in turn enhances your agency reputation and gets you more referrals. But in short, we simplify vendor management. We have found that a lot of agencies have four or five different vendor partners for things like software, billing, coding, analytics, CAP surveys, and we really can make your life much easier by putting all of these things together under one simple contract. Solution Suite really is unique to the marketplace and offers a significant value to home health organizations. So if you'd like to learn more, just reach out to us and we will be happy to share the details. Mary, the last slide, please. That concludes today's presentation. As you log out of the webinar, as I said, you will see a survey pop up asking for feedback on today's presentation. You can also use this survey to let us know if you're interested in Solution Suite or any of the other products and services that Healthcare First offers to home health agencies. On behalf of Mary St. Pierre, Deanna Loftus, and the entire team here at Healthcare First, Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you will join us again for more webinars in the future. Have a great afternoon, and thank you for being our customer.